So then uh, let me have this opportunity to introduce you. So uh, please welcome uh, Professor Yakub uh, Sheffer. Uh, is, is that pronounced correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, he's a associate professor, uh, uh, associate professor at uh, the electrical engineering department at the Yale University, where he also runs the CAS lab that focuses on research on the frontiers of computer architecture and hardware security. Uh, he has received his PhD and uh, MS from Princeton University and his bachelor from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. So today uh, we'll be uh, listening. Yakub on, uh, he will be sharing his latest research on remote power attacks on versatile tensor uh, uh, accelerators in multi tenant generation. So I hope the, the floor is yours. Oh, great. Th thank, thank you so much. Th thanks, uh, Basheen and Avi, for uh, inviting me to, the, to give a presentation. So uh, today I want to talk about our work on uh, basically remote power attacks against uh, machine learning implementations running on uh, on FPGAs. And one example is the Versal Tensor Accelerator, but I'll talk about some other uh, some other work as well. So um, in our research, uh, we've been basically motivated by the fact that uh, there's been an increase in last year's in interest and actually deployment of uh, field programmable gate arrays uh, in the cloud. And so basically now the FPGAs, instead of having an FPGA in your lab, the FPGAs are available in the, in the data center and this lets you have a uh, really great flexibility and also can be used to accelerate a performance and so what people what people are actually interested in is to accelerate the machine learning applications by using these FPGAs um, in the cloud. So you basically have a, a data center and there's a bunch of servers and other FPGAs and of course GPUs and other uh, types of accelerators. Now uh, one one new thing though is that the FPGAs in the cloud also provide uh, unique avenues for uh, malicious attacks on the on other cloud users or cloud infrastructure, especially when you have these multi-tenant FPGAs where different users are, are assigned to share the same uh, same FPGA hardware. So, um, what uh, again, what in particular, what we're interested in is in machine learning applications running on these FPGAs and kind of types of attacks that could be possible. And then, you know, once you understand the attacks, how to actually uh, defend them. So in uh, in this talk, um, I'll give you some background on uh, FPGAs. Um, I'll talk a bit about the um, FPGA infrastructure in the cloud and the thread model for uh, machine learning are running on cloud FPGAs. I also talk a bit about uh, thermal and voltage sensor circuits that that you can use to basically measure the uh, the, well, the thermal and then also the power the characteristics of different uh, circuits running on the uh, on the FPGA. And then I'll talk about the different uh, attacks on machine learning uh, with attacks on custom accelerators and then the uh, recent work on the versatile tensor accelerator and then to give you some conclusion and some uh, suggestions for kind of interesting research that you can all can take a look at. So um, basically uh, the, the focus of this talk is again about the FPGAs in the cloud and now public cloud um, FPGA is a, a computing paradigm where the FPGA boards are available in the data center instead of having one in the lab. So again you have a FPGA board uh, but now you have a, a cloud provider who has a bunch of servers with a bunch of FPGA boards connected to the server and of course they have uh, many of those uh, of those servers so users can uh, basically flexibly uh, and quickly access the FPGA resources by connecting remotely to the server so uh, it's, you can get on demand pay, pay as you go service so basically as many FPGAs as you you know you can afford you can rent them and you can actually very quickly provision them and you know test out different designs or run your or run your hardware uh, and then uh, there are already many providers um, that deploy different types of FPGAs. So um, the main ones are, of course, uh, from, from Xilinx uh, and Altera. And there are different providers like Amazon Web Services, uh, Microsoft Azure, um, Alibaba, and others that are, are providing these FPGAs. So uh, in our work, we've, we focus on Amazon Web Services just because it's sort of the easiest to, to access and use. But there, again, there are other other providers, and, and then they're not, not just the Xilinx boards, but the Intel boards, and a lot of the ideas I think are quite are quite similar. Um, so um, this is a different view of the of the cloud FPGA, and there are um, many uh, shared resources, shared hardware resources, which uh, and a lot of those can become sources of different security attacks, not not just the ones that I'll, I'll talk about today. Uh, but in general, we have uh, this idea of single tenant cloud FPGAs, uh, where you have one. Um, each FPGA rather gets assigned to one user. And then also there's multi-tenant um, FPGAs where there are multiple users um, assigned to one FPGA. But the setup is quite similar that again, you have a server with a bunch of FPGAs uh, typically using PCI Express to connect the boards uh, to the server. So for example, the shared PCI eBus can become a source of uh, vulnerabilities. Then you have other 
uh, shared resources such as you know the server power and, and cooling. There's actually shared resources between uh, different servers, and then you know in different uh, in different settings, for example, in the multi-tenant in particular, you have the shared resources within one FPGA itself. So in this talk, I'll talk I'll focus on the multi-tenant um, sending and sharing of the resources within one FPGA, uh, but there are other attacks that are possible by uh, by leveraging these other um, shared resources. And for the threat model that that we're interested in uh, when attacking machine learning on cloud-based FPGAs is that we assume that the uh, cloud FPGA provider is um, sort of trusted and that the data center is secure. So there are no, uh, no physical attacks that, that we're worried about. Uh, but what we're worried about is that different tenants or different users of the, of the FPGAs could mutually try to attack each other or even try to attack the, uh, the cloud infrastructure. So, so, other users, so if you have a victim user, then there are other users who could try to attack uh, the machine learning running, run by the victim user by you know, leaking information or, or stealing information or even just trying to monitor uh, type of operations that the that the victim is uh, is is doing, uh, and then there are also other uh, attacks that are um, I would say more generic. For example, stealing information from the shell. So shell is part of the FPGA that's sort of uh, provided by the cloud provider, and it's to to sort kind of facilitate the the you know the PCI e communication and kind of manage the resources on the FPGA. So if the user is trying to attack the shell, they can also get some information. It's not about just attacking other. Um, other users. And you can also reverse engineer the cloud infrastructure that might give you some, some advantage uh, or you know, induce faults or, or waste resources, which might kind of deny service to other, um, other users. So uh, all these different attacks are possible. And again, there's a sort of a single um, tenant set setting where uh, the different users uh, would be on different FPGA. So let's say you know, one would be the victim and the other uh, would be the attacker. And then in a multi-tenant setting, the different users are on the same um, FPGA. Um, all right, and then so uh, when you have so in the, in so next now I talk about different uh, thermal and voltage sensors that that we can use uh, very quickly. Um, I'll just go quickly over it, but basically when you have different users running on the same FPGA, uh, the attacker um, needs or wants some way to measure the activity of the victim and to measuring uh, for measuring thermal activity or, or voltage changes, uh, which is used in our power attacks. You can basically use um, ring oscillators or time to uh, time to digital. Uh, converters and uh, so a ring oscillator is basically a, a loop of uh, inverter gates that's connected up in a loop and then that creates an oscillating signal that depends on the on the voltage or or the temperature of the FPGA board or you can use a time to digital uh, converter which basically uses uh, a delay uh, a delay line to kind of measure how far a signal propagates based on that again the temperature or the or the current voltage in the in the board uh, so um, I don't think I'll, I'll go into the details of these uh, maybe you can look at the slides um, and, um, after the talk, but uh, again, in the ring oscillator, sort of you have this oscillation of values that is uh, happening within the ring oscillator, and then it this uh, this depends on the you know as the temperature increases, for example, the frequency drops, or as the uh, voltage drops due to activity of other circuits, the frequency drops as well. So this is one of the key things. If you have a machine learning uh, circuit running and it's doing some operation, the you know it will use up some power. Uh, the voltage in the board might drop a little bit, which can be detected by monitoring the frequency of the ring oscillator. Um, and there are different um, different types of ring oscillators based on uh, lookup tables or multiplexers, uh, latches or flip flops. So um, I'll not go into the detail. Although one one interesting thing I wanted to mention that we recently uh, found out is that the cloud providers are beginning to kind of block different types of circuits that you're deploying on the cloud. So for example. Uh, these lookup table based uh, ring oscillators have been have been blocked by by Amazon for a while, uh, and then recently we found out that the latch based um, ring oscillators are sort of effectively blocked, so you cannot deploy them on the cloud. So there there's still different ones you can deploy, but the the cloud providers are sort of uh, playing cat and mouse game where you know as new threats become available, they try to prevent them by, for example, blocking these different types of uh, of sensors. Uh, and then the other type of sensor, which actually we use in this work, is the time to digital converter. Uh, and then the idea here is that within the FPGA, um, you know, you have these commentary uh, logic blocks, and then they have slices. And um, the, the key part is that within each slice, you have uh, lookup tables uh, that are used to do the computation. And then there's some flip flops, and then different lookup tables are connected by these fast carry chains that are originally used for. 
uh, for different types of adders. But these carry chains can be used as a sort of uh, for, a, for a delay line. So in a, in a time to digital converter, you basically have a setup where you have, um, for example, 256 uh, uh, flip-flops that are capturing the value. And then as the, you know, as the signal propagates through the carry chain uh, during one clock cycle, you sort of measure how far the, the signal propagates. And this depends on the, um, sorry, this depends on the voltage of the board, for example. So you can measure the voltage by, by measuring how far the signal um, has propagated. Uh, so by using the TDCs, uh, you can, again, if, if a machine learning circuit is running on the board, it's going to use some power, which is going to uh, lower, uh, going to drop the voltage inside the FPGA board. And then that will cause uh, basically slower propagation of the signal in the TDC. So you can measure effectively the voltage and the activity of the machine learning circuit by um, looking at the, the TDC uh, outcomes. Uh, all right, so uh, so I hope I hope that I give you some uh, very brief uh, background on um, cloud FPGAs and different different sensors for measuring especially uh, voltage. So now I'll talk about the main part, which is uh, different types of attacks on uh, machine learning accelerators. Uh, and but first, I'll begin by talking about the uh, multi-tenant FPGAs. So um, I already mentioned that there's sort of the single tenant um, idea where you have one user um, running. On, on the whole FPGA by themselves, or you can have a multi-tenant uh, setup where you have um, multiple FPGA, multiple different users being placed on the on on one FPGA. So, uh, so actually, since few years, um, I guess it's around maybe 2018, I think this was one of the first papers. But there have been a number of papers that have proposed this idea that basically you have um, different users, and then you know these you can see different colors on the FPGA, and either they can be you know separate to different different regions, or you can take the code. From different users and kind of compile it together and and kind of get mixed up and place it on the on the FPGA. So this is the picture here on the on the right. But in all of the cases, basically you have different users that are on the same FPGA. And at least for today's FPGAs, that means that all the users are sharing the same power distribution network um, in the FPGA. So if let's say if the red user uh, is the is the machine learning circuit. Maybe the blue user is the attacker that has the TDC sensor. And because the power uh, distribution is shared between the two, um, the, again, if there's some big computation happening in the machine learning circuit, that will drop the voltage in the FPGA board. And then the, the, the blue TDC uh, circuit could, uh, could measure it. And of, of course, these, these are <laughs> the sizes of these circuits are not, not, not to scale. And I also should also say that. If, if you go to, to Amazon or, 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 or Microsoft or the other providers, at least today, uh, they don't provide the, the multi-tenant option yet. So, so the current providers are single tenant, where you get a single user per FPGA. Uh, but again, since few years, a lot of researchers, and I understand that that industry has also picked up this interest, uh, have proposed that you have different users on the same FPGA, which, for example, uh, makes uh, resource utilization better because you can assign multiple users to one FPGA, but it opens up such attacks like oh, that I'm talking about today due to the shared power uh, distribution network. Um, um, yep. Yeah. And then so, um, all right. So, so, so now I want to talk about some, you know, some recent uh, results and just get, give you an idea of different types of attacks that are possible. And, and then so in particular things that should be, uh, should be defended. Uh, against as if you try to deploy machine learning on the cloud and you have some sensitive uh, computation. So uh, one of the one of the first works uh, that we looked at is a is a custom a machine learning accelerator. And so the idea here was that you have a, a binarized neural network accelerator that is used for um, image recognition from the MNIST uh, handwritten uh, data set. So basically the idea is you're you're doing inference and you're trying to detect you know what uh, what what number or what letter uh, an image uh, represents. It, at least for this work, it was a it was a black and white images. Um, but I know we can uh, try to extend it to to different color images. Uh, and in in this setup, um, even though this is a custom accelerator, the actually the the security evaluation and attack setup is you know is very similar to uh, to the VTA attack that I'll talk about later. Is that you have the machine learning circuit running in one part of the FPGA, uh, and then you have the attacker. Uh, in this case, in this in this case again, the time to digital converter sensor in the other part of the FPGA. So they so they can be physically, uh, you know, on different parts of the FPGAs, different even different ends of the FPGA. But because of the shared power distribution network, uh, and you know, 
major computation by the neural network circuit will affect the voltage that the TDC uh, can measure. And uh, I should maybe mention that for, uh, for the, these types of attacks, we've, we're using uh, TDC because you can have much quicker uh, measurements. So basically you can measure every, uh, every few cycles. Whereas if you use a ring oscillator, you can measure the, the voltage and the frequency changes, but it takes you know, uh, a large number of cycles to get the, get the measurement because you have to measure many different ring, uh, ring uh, oscillator uh, oscillations. So, so a TDC uh, is much quicker um, to measure uh, voltage changes. So it, it, it proves very useful for for measuring for you know for attacking the neural networks, uh, but it does uh, require sort of maybe more calibration to to actually get the uh, you know get the, the the delay in the TDC to be just just right in the idle state so that when there's some activity you can you can distinguish it. So um, the TDCs I think may be a little more difficult to work with, but they give you much uh, much better uh, much better measurement. And then so in in this work when we're looking at a custom ML accelerator, and then this again uh, this actually was a prototype. Uh, on our local board, so we're sort of we're prototyping this multi-tenant setting since it's not available uh, from uh, from Amazon or other cloud providers. Uh, the TDC is doing the measurements, and then because of the shared uh, on-chip power distribution network, it's able to observe voltage drops as the VNN is processing some input images. So in this uh, in this work, we're looking at assuming you know the the, the, the structure of the VNN, uh, and then you are trying to recover what is the input image. So uh, I think the motivation, of course, you know, MNIST is, uh, is, is a simple case, but the motivation in the end is, for example, if somebody's processing black and white uh, medical images, could, uh, it could, an, could eventually an attacker, uh, uh, could attacker recover some of those inputs which are, which are sensitive. So we're trying to recover the inputs. And um, I see there's a there's a, a question in the chat, so I'll I'll answer the question when uh, I'll, I'll I'll finish talking about the the custom accelerator um, attack. Uh, and then so in in this work again we're looking on a BNN, uh, which there's a black and white image that's that's an input, um, and then you have many layers processing the input during the inference, and we're focusing on the first uh, convolution layer where you're processing the the raw uh, input bits from the image. And then so uh, to 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 demonstrate the attack. Basically, we um, the students students implemented a uh, convolution layer in an accelerator on the FPGA that was receiving the, the input images. You can see here uh, you have one input that's processed by the uh, convolution layer at a time, uh, and then in parallel you have a TDC running adjacent on the same FPGA board. So as the as the convolution uh, operations are being performed, the TDC is measuring the uh, the power usage and the voltage drops to recover. You know, interesting um, information. And then, so we have these, so basically the TDC uh, gives you a, a time series of the, of the voltage changes as the input images are, um, are being processed. Uh, and then here's uh, more, more details about the convolution unit design to give you an idea how the attack works. So basically you have the, again, you have the input image and in our design, it was processed, you take, you know, three by three chunks of the input image uh, and then you convolve it with a three by three kernel. So you're sort of scanning the, the image um, kind of horizontally row by row, um, the different three, nine by, sorry, three by three pixels. So you have nine, nine pixels with uh, eight bit values and they're being multiplied by, uh, by these binary kernels since it's a binary network. Uh, and then so as you're, um, as you're multiplying uh, the input with the, with the kernel, uh, the different values of the input pixels will generate different power usage. So you can see, uh, in particular here that you can have uh, observed different voltage drops and then for uh, for background uh, for background uh, pixels which are dark which are represented by values close to zero you have uh, very little voltage drop uh, and then for values that are uh, closer to a foreground pixel which is a white value uh, sorry to, to white pixel which is a you know high value uh, integer then the voltage drop is a is observed is much bigger. So by basically by monitoring the, the voltage drops as the three by three you know, matrix is being processed, you can uh, estimate whether you're processing a foreground pixel or a, uh, or a background pixel. And then by running the same image, um, you know, hundreds to thousands of times on the FPGA, you can um, observe, you know, uh, basically you can average the information to recover the, the input pixels and uh, actually, um, our, our, our most recent work actually has extended this that, you know, the image doesn't have to be uh, exactly the same. There might be, there could be some noise. So, for example, you could apply this 
if you had like a security camera that's feeding you some black and white images, you know, if the consecutive images are uh, very similar, that kind of that's, that's effectively the same as processing, you know, hundreds or thousands of the same um, input image. And again, we use this threshold method to when you, you know, classify the voltage drops as foreground and background. And so this is uh, probably the, the, mo the most cool, cool result is that on, on the top, you see the, the original image that, that's being input to the, um, to the uh, BNN, to the convolution layer. And then you have the Zinc um, ZCU-104 FPGA or the Vertex VCU-118 FPGA. And you can see that the recovered images, um, you know, you can, you know, some of them are a bit worse than others, but in general, you can recover what was the what was the input? And uh, the zinc one has the ARM core, and then the VCU one one eight is, is is not exactly the same as used in in Amazon, but it's quite uh, quite similar. And uh, again, if you have more more runs, that helps with the uh, with the accuracy. So you can see here, you know, going from hundred to three thousand runs, and then also the type of FPGA uh, makes a makes a difference, uh, and also uh, the location of the FPGA makes a difference. So if you're we're adjacent to the uh, machine learning circuit versus on the other side. So I cross die on the other side of the FPGA, uh, the voltage drop uh, is a little bit less. So then the recovered information is, is less. But in general, it, it is possible to basically monitor the voltage changes and see what is what is the input processed by, by another user on the same FPGA, which I think is uh, is pretty, uh, pretty cool. Um, all right, so uh, before I talk about the uh, VTA, uh, there was a question, uh, do you think it's possible to run fault injection attacks on multi-tenant scenario? Uh, that, that is a very good question. Um, uh, number of, uh, not number, maybe one or two research groups uh, have tried the fault injection attacks. Uh, and uh, I, I think in a realistic scenario, it, it's currently not possible because the, of the voltage drops that, that you create by, for example, running a big circuit on the FPGA is not enough to affect the timing. So, so this, when, you, when you deploy a circuit um, on the FPGA, uh, there's automatically some margin inserted. So if, if there's some voltage or frequency changes, you know, um, unless, you're, unless you're sort of overclocking your machine learning circuit, there's some buffer if, for, for small voltage changes. So um, I, I think people have tried. I, I don't think there's a successful fault injection attack. Are there successful attacks where you just crash the board by, you know, by running a lot of ring oscillators and, and consuming a lot of power. But um, I think that, 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 you know, creating a realistic fault injection attack on the shared FPGA, I think would be really, really cool if you can demonstrate it without sort of overclocking the, uh, the, the machine learning accelerator. So, um, so I hope that that answers the question and I can also maybe, maybe say more at the end. Uh, but in the, in the few minutes that are remaining, I want to talk uh, about the, the VTA attack and then some, uh, you know, some ideas and future work on you know deploying these attacks on the public uh, cloud-based FPGA. So um, I think one of the um, challenges. So 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 far, I've talked about attacking a custom accelerator where you have you know a hardware module for each uh, for each operation, and each each module performs a very specific task. And for example, you can place the TDC sort of relatively close to the to the module. So for example, next to the convolution unit. Now uh, in the in the VTA or other a processor like ML accelerators, instead of having hardwired uh, the model into the hardware, it's more like a processor that it, that's executing the instructions. So now you're now you're looking into monitoring the the power profile of the different instructions being executed on the uh, on this processor that's sort of realized inside the FPGA. And then so these are uh, you know some some challenges that you have to focus on and, and try to solve and you know basically you monitoring individual instructions and so you have to profile these different instructions try to map the instructions to specific layers of the of the of the machine learning model and perhaps you know look at more coarse grain information such as you know maybe you can recover the number of uh, a number of layers or type of layers but not you know maybe not exactly the input so um, in our work we, we looked at this open source VTA. Uh, Accelerator because it's um, available publicly and and it's sort of a processor like design which is different from a hard coded design uh, and I should just say that you know VTA basically realizes machine learning uh, as a set of instructions and then the different layers are realized by multi one or more instructions and then instructions are um, load um, um, matrix multiply ALU or store operations so there's sort of four sort of like a four instruction uh, CPU. And um, I don't have time to, I think, talk about this in detail, but the, the idea of how you execute a, a program or a machine learning 
uh, model on, on the VTA is that the host CPU loads the FPGA's DRAM with the instructions and the data. Then it triggers the VTA processor on the FPGA, which basically loads the data from the DRAM, does some computations, uh, and stores it. And then at the end, the host CPU reads the, reads the data back. And this host CPU can either be the ARM core in an SOC setup, or it can be the cloud server in the cloud-based FPGA. So basically, the FPGA is the, uh, you know, the cloud-based FPGA, and then the host CPU is the server sending uh, information. And to prototype the attack on VTA, uh, we since again, there is no public multi-tenant uh, available yet, yet in the local setting, we had this VTA accelerator and the TDC sensor on the same FPGA. Uh, they do share the AXI crossbar just for the control, uh, but it's not actually used in any part of the attack. So it's not, um, you know, it, it's there just to kind of for the for getting things to, uh, to synchronize and work. And then again, you have the VTA and TDC on the same FPGA. Uh, and then similarly to uh, the uh, BNN accelerator, we can measure the voltage changes as the uh, VTA uh, is executing. And in this case, for example, we can find out the type of instruction. So you can see the load store versus ALU versus matrix, matrix multiply has different power uh, power profiles. And then if you look at the, the, the matrix multiply instruction, uh, you know, different parameters, uh, such as, for example, the number of input channels, uh, which is N here, affect uh, the, you know, the, the power signature. Basically, you know, you have different number of peaks or the, or the spacing between the peaks is, is different. So you can recover sort of the type of instructions or some information about the instructions that are, uh, that are being executed. Uh, and then what this, in the end, allows you to do is, for example, recover some information about the machine learning model. So for example, you have uh, ResNet 18 versus mobile net, and then you know, different layers of the ResNet and mobile net, again, have different uh, power signatures. So by, by measuring the, the power signature as the, the VTA is running, you can find out, you know, uh, you know, you can classify, for example, which machine learning circuit is running um, on the FPGA. And um, yeah, and then in the last, last few minutes, uh, I just want to talk about sort of uh, act towards, you know, going towards attack on public cloud, cloud-based FPGAs and, and conclude with some, uh, some challenges and, and research, I think, interesting recent direction. So, uh, so far what I've talked about has been a prototype on, on local FPGA board where we kind of simulate this multi-tenant setting. Uh, now, it's also possible to try to do it on cloud-based FPGA. Uh, again, there's no... Uh, no multi-tenant, but we can try to simulate the multi-tenant on the cloud FPGA instead of simulating it locally. And at least for the VTA, uh, there are different implementations. So there's one based on the TVM that we lose locally, but there's also this Canopy uh, TVM version that, that can be used on, on Amazon. Uh, the one interesting challenge and, and difference is, for example, the Canopy uses high-level synthesis to, to generate the hardware. So uh, it's sort of all the, all the VTA gets generated as a single hardware blob that gets put on the um, on the on the FPGA, and this makes you know this is another challenge, another difficulty in, in measuring the uh, the uh, the behavior of the VTA because again it's it's hard to place the TDC. You don't know what 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 unit you're placing the TDC next to. Uh, but uh, as a, as a preliminary work, uh, we believe it's still possible. So this is sort of a, a floor plan of the the orange is the shell. We have the the red uh, uh, is the canopy, I believe, and then the the yellow is the is the TDC that's doing the the measurement. And uh, just uh, very briefly, uh, again, these are examples of measurements of these traces on, on, the, on the FPGAs running on Amazon. Uh, so here you have, for example, ResNet uh, 50 versus IDLE. You can you know, clearly see some, some differences. Or, or you can, you know, if you have different matrix multiply operations, you can again see the different, the, you know, the, the size of the peaks or, or the spacing is different. Uh, you will notice that, that the quality of these um, is, is worse than on the local board. A part of it is fewer number of measurements that we did, but also the other part is the uh, bigger, uh, better FPGAs in the cloud have better uh, power distribution networks and they sort of, they manage the voltage changes better. So it's, uh, the attacks become more difficult. But anyway, these are preliminary results. And, you know, I, I think we'll be able to show that it is indeed possible to, to attack these, these accelerators um, in the cloud. So, um, all right, <laughs> in the last 30 seconds, I just want to kind of, um, summarize and give some conclusions. So I think you know security of machine learning on FPGA is sort of a bit of a, of a hot topic. There's uh, quite a few papers in the last 
last two, three years, um, focusing on ML, on FPGA and different types of attacks. Uh, but many of the attacks, including our own, use local or emulated boards. Uh, so I think um, you know very few examples of real attacks on, on public cloud-based FPGA. So um, I think that's where you know a good good research direction is just you know there are new new engineering challenges and research challenges trying it on actual public FPGAs, not just emulating in the lab. Uh, and then, for example, one of the research challenges I think is again how to synchronize or trigger the attacks because in the lab you have full control and can trigger the sensors very nicely, whereas in the cloud you sort of everything's running asynchronously. And how do you trigger the attackers? So um, again, so there's you know many many challenges in the attacks and also defenses and integrating these defenses. Like you know, cloud providers are slowly trying to ban ring oscillators. Maybe there's need to to do more work on actually deploying the different defenses. So um, th thank you so much uh, for, for listening. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Shen Chuen Tian, a PhD student here in our group, and Cheyenne Amoin, who's a PhD student at UMass, who did a majority of this work, as well as Ross and Dan from UMass, with, which, with whom we have this collaboration on the cloud FPG uh, security research. So uh, yeah, th thank you so much. And uh, I, I'm happy to take questions, although I think I'm, I'm over time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yaku. That was very interesting uh, work, actually, and yeah, we look forward to the uh, to the trailer of the last few things that uh, that you showed in the in the final slides. Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> so uh, I have a question from uh, from Sital over here, uh, who's asking: uh, Did you get a chance to check the effect of temperature inversion in sub twenty nano uh, twenty eight nanometer FPGAs used in AWS? Uh, temp I I no, no we haven't looked at at a temperature inversion we um, we looked at uh, in other work we looked at at measuring uh, the temperature by either ring oscillators or actually measuring the temperature of the whole um, FPGA boards by using a DRAM decay so uh, we've looked at a bit at temp temperature but we haven't looked at this a temperature inversion that that might be uh, might be something interesting. All right. Uh, uh, so, audience, please feel uh, free to put your questions in the chat or the Q and A session. Uh, in the meantime, Yako, I have two short questions actually. So, uh, it uh, like in the initial slides you were sharing about this uh, ring oscillators being uh, barred from uh, from multi tenant FP or cloud based FPGAs. So, uh, like, uh, are, are there research which uh, which assess like the uh, obfuscation techniques in, in bypassing them or uh, like? Uh, are, are yeah, yeah um, I, I, yes. So I don't. I'm. I'm not sure if. Uh, I, guess, I guess we don't call it obfuscation, but it, but that that's a good way to put it. So so there are many, uh, uh, many many different um, many different designs of ring oscillators that you can use. Um, maybe I can. Oh, uh, maybe I can uh, go back to the to the slide very quickly. Uh, uh, here, so so the ring oscillators can be based on, for example, lookup tables or, or multiplexers or these latches or flip flops. So the idea is that in 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 um, inside this ring oscillator, if you can see my pointer, in between some of the inverters, you put another non-inverting circuit like a like a latch or or or, or a flip flop, and then basically the the tools uh, will. Will do not, will sort of ignore. The, they think there's a flip flop, so let's ignore that and not count it as a combinatorial loop. But uh, so so there's been sort of a bit of obfuscation by trying to use these different uh, different uh, different circuits. But you know the cloud providers are sort of catching up and and trying to block these. Uh, right. I, I, I maybe I, sh I can add quickly that the the or I think originally the issue is that the combinatorial loops can basically cause a lot of power power drain. So there's sort of more a reliability issue. I, I don't think they were originally blocking it because of the security issues. But um, again, with these, for example, with these latch uh, uh, based ring oscillators, it's a very specific circuit. So, um, you know, I'm assuming they started to block it because of, you know, too many people were trying to show, you know, security issues with these ring oscillators on, 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 their, on, their, on their cloud FPGAs. Uh, what is the what is the charging model for these uh, for these FPGA? Do they charge by the area or power? Because in... uh, yeah, so they charge by uh, by time by uh, by by I think it's by the minute or or by the hour in the in the worst. So um, the, the the cost I think is like a dollar per hour for for one FPGA, about maybe one or two dollars per hour, which uh, in the short term is much cheaper than you know buying the FPGA and the licenses. 
especially if you can't get like a free academic license. Um, we, we, we've spent a fair amount of money renting FPGAs from Amazon. So I think, you know, uh, if you're like a company, you know, maybe it's cool to prototype. I, I think in the end, it sort of makes sense to just buy your own FPGAs. But uh, it, if, if you need, you know, if you need like 100 FPGAs tomorrow, then Amazon is, and the other providers are great, you know, just pay a few dollars an hour and you can deploy your circuits. So um, I, I think as, as, it, as we move to the multi-tenant FPGAs, if we move to the multi-tenant, then may, maybe they'll start charging by the area. You know, if you have a big circuit, you pay more. If you have a less, you have a smaller area, you pay, you pay less. So um, there would also, I think, like, uh, uh, charging by the power can also discourage some people to, to put in ring oscillators. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, again, uh, they, they do monitor the power a little bit. Again, I think for to prevent the boards from uh, from crashing. So if you, if you use too much power, uh, they will sort of cut off your your design. Uh, but again, there, there are other we didn't do it, but there's other research groups that that did show that you can you can crash the board. So if you sort of if you ramp up the power too quickly, basically they're not able to catch it in time, and and then the board eventually crashes. Uh, so I think the problem is that, you know, they have like eight, eight FPGAs in a server. And if all the eight, eight FPGAs are using, you know, hundreds of watts of power at the same time, the server can't handle it. So they have to kind of power, you know, try to catch users before they use too much, too much power. All right. We also have another question from uh, Chip. Uh, so he said, how do you identify what applications are running on a multi-tenant FPGA? If there are uh, another application beside the victim running, how could you deal with that? Ah, that, that, that is a really good question. So uh, um, I, I think it's, a, it's an open question. So uh, we, we've done some research to, to try to, to look at, for example, the monitor the, the communication between the, the host computer and the FPGA. So, so they're using a PCIe bus and you can monitor sort of, you can estimate the traffic um, on the PCIe by, bus by monitoring the contention. And then you could use that to maybe identify the application. So for example, you looked at uh, different uh, video processing applications running on the FPGA. So you, you, you have to use some sort of a, a side channel to try to identify what the victim is, is, is doing. So uh, maybe again, monitoring the traffic or, um, you know, like I was showing, uh, uh, showing at the very end, you know, different, uh, different ML circuits have, uh, have different power, uh, what's the, you know, here it is, you know, different ML circuits have different power signatures. So if, if you collect signatures for non-machine learning circuits, you could sort of measure the power in the background and kind of try to guess what the user is doing. But indeed, if, if you have like three or four users on the same FPGA, uh, this becomes uh, quite difficult. And I, I don't think anybody has, has looked at it so far. Um, I, I think the, the short answer is that basically if you have, you know, if you have enough users creating enough different operations, it's going to be very difficult to, to measure the power, uh, you know, or, or measure one specific user and not being confused by the, uh, by the power. So, so there's actually some defense work that uses this idea that, you know, between the attacker and the victim, you place, um, you know, you place another circuit that basically consumes random amounts of power so that the, the measurement circuit gets confused. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the, dealing with multiple users is, is an open issue, I think. All right, so I think uh, we are through with the questions. So thanks a lot Yaku, for, for sharing uh, like this work and, and also like making time to, uh, to give us a presentation this early in the morning. Yeah, definitely, Th thank, thank you so much. And um, I, I, need to, I need to run, but uh, I'll try to catch up with all the slides uh, after the seminar. So th thanks again, everybody.